Hey guys, this is Mark Goldberg from Mark Vlogs Watches. Thank you so much for joining me today for this exciting episode. But before we jump into the meat and potatoes of the issue at hand, a couple quick housekeeping points. First, I'm trying something new. Today, instead of making you look at my ugly mug, I'm going to be showing you pictures of watches, some of which we will be discussing in this video. And secondly, do me a huge favor, please like this video and subscribe so we can do this again together. Now, the topic. What is the role of the fun watch in the life of the Rolex collector? I'll be speaking certainly from the personal perspective so I can tell you how my life has evolved as to where I'm wearing more and more fun watches other than just Rolex. But I wanna know from your point of view, does the fun watch fit into your life as a collector? And not only that, but what's your definition of the fun watch? Okay guys, let's jump into it right now. Okay guys, well, I am trying something new here. Let me know in the comments how you like it rather than stare at my ugly mug for the duration of this video. I will merely be flashing uh, visuals of watches that I own, some of which I love, and uh, some of which are just kind of there for fun. Now, the topic today is how to keep yourself satisfied emotionally in the watch game without a, driving yourself crazy, and without breaking the bank. Now, as you know, if I were to single out my, my, my favorite brand, if I had to say, look, I'm going down to one brand only, if you know anything about my channel, I'm pretty sure you could guess the answer to that, and it would be Rolex. So first, let me tell you why, and then we'll discuss that as a, as a group in the comments, but also I wanna then deviate into the alternatives, because the reality is nobody needs to be a one brand guy. So first, Rolex. Why, why Rolex? Why not Audemars Piguet? Uh, or as I like to say on this channel, why not Audemars Piguet, Patek Philippe, Vachelon et Constantin? Well, the first reason is, is it hurts my face to say those brands, okay? I mean, realistically, Hans Wilsdorf, the, the guy who, who, who started Rolex, literally picked out a word. He made up a word. Well, what a brilliant man. What a brilliant marketing individual. He literally made up a word that never existed because he, he was multilingual, he traveled, and he believed that Rolex was a word which could be pronounced, in, you know, basically by any tongue. So it was unique, it was short, it was sweet. You know what? That reminds me a lot of um, all the early guys who took the dot-coms, right? in the early days of the internet finding like, uh, oh gosh, Alibaba. How about Amazon? Just where people made up words and then st stuck them on a website and now those words are famous. A really good example of that is Google. Who ever heard of Google? Nobody ever heard of Google until some guy said, you know what, I want to make something unique, something better, something that ultimately everyone in the world is going to know of and I shall call it Google. I mean, honestly, that's pretty brave. And that's what Hans Wilsdorf did with Rolex. So one of the things I like about Rolex is the thought that went into every aspect of the creation of this brand that started with the literal name of the watch itself. Now, why does that matter? Because Cartier is a brand which is also well known and actually happens to be a brand I like very much. I own a Cartier Calibre de Diver in bleu, which is blue. So, but really, actually, other than Rolex, I think Cartier is probably the only other brand name who makes watches, which is going to have like a near 100% recognition ratio um, in, in terms of brand recognition worldwide. Audemars, Piguet, Vacheron et Constantin, Patek Philippe. Well, you know, these brands on some level are hotter in the horology game or category than is Rolex, but they're not nearly as well known and that disturbs me. I mean, I, I, let's face it, maybe this is shallow of me, but I'm gonna fess up to it right now. Guys, if I'm gonna spend 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, $50,000 on a watch, I would really kind of like it to be not a secret that it's good, right? And I feel like if you buy an Aldi Malpiguet or a Vacheron Constantin, you're gonna be explaining that watch. And I, that is something that I never wanna have to do 
um, with a, you know, a, a, a giant investment. Now, look, if you have, I don't know, if you've got a big pair and you say to yourself, hey man, I am absolutely comfortable. In fact, I'm more comfortable with stealth wealth, something that flies under the radar. Well, I understand that and I, I salute you. Let me just say, I, I salute my brother, um, Bruce Williams, who owns from the very lowest of the low, you know, with his Seiko SKX and rebuying Seikos, being sucked back into the dark side of cheaper watches, which by the way, is the next point of order that I wanna talk about in this video. Um, and he owns that all the way through his, his own, and I think still does Vacheron and, and Rolex. But okay, look, here's the deal guys. Rolex does it for me because in my age bracket, it was and is the I made it watch. I remember I bought my first one in approximately 1986 or 1987. It was a little 34 millimeter two-tone date on a Jubilee. I still own it, champagne dial. Kenny Nguyen from Jewelers on Time restored it for me. Looks like new, but I'll tell you what, back in the 80s and well into the 90s, I wore that watch on the daily. It was my one and only. I did not own a beater. I did not know what the concept of beater was. That Rolex was my dress watch. It was my beater watch. It was my vacation watch. It was my gardening watch. I had it, so I mean, I put that watch through a lot, guys, because I took it you know, to beaches where it got sandy. I took it into swimming pools where it got wet and same with the ocean. I, I planted a lot of trees back in that era in my garden and I had my elbow, I was elbows deep in cow manure with that watch. And I will tell you, it ran magnificently for approximately 15 years before it ever looked at me funny and said, hey dude, you better service me, right? So that's the other aspect of Rolex, which I appreciate is the robustness of these things. Now, naturally, if you get a solid gold piece or you've put, you know, $20,000 into a two-tone piece on the secondary market, you're gonna, you're gonna feel bad about, you know, gardening in the thing. And thus the, 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 the concept of the beater has, has been born. But you gotta remember when I bought that date in the, in the mid eighties, um, what I passed up was the Rolex Submariner. Nobody wanted those. By the way, back then, when I was a kid, children, you know, you'd walk into an authorized dealer and the cases were bursting full, absolutely. You, you walk out of there with literally anything you want from a, um, from a date, steel Daytona with a Lemania movement <laughs> that's impossible, you know, to find now, all the way, uh, you know, down through sea dwellers and submariners and anything, anything that you wanted. Yet the, the watch that was prized, the, the, the one that everybody wanted, were the dates and the date justs. And so I got me one of those and I think I spent around $2,500 for it, bypassing the steel Submariner, which was in the $800 range. And I kicked myself, you know? If I could go back in time, I would bet on Secretariat and I would buy like every Submariner, you know, red line Submariner that I could, that I could find back then. But alas, I cannot do so. I'm stuck here in the present with you good people. Anyway, that's what it is about Rolex. It's robust. Um, everybody knows it holds value. Now, look, is there some annoying stuff about Rolex, especially right now? Absolutely. They have made this brand so difficult to obtain in their quest to, to overtake Patek Philippe in exclusivity. You know, but it's an ironic thing. They're achieving their goal, okay, which is to supplant uh, Patek Philippe. I've been saying this for several years now. But the reality is, is that Rolex is cranking out somewhere in the neighborhood as best we can figure of 800,000 watches per year. And Patek Philippe makes something like 80,000 per year. Uh, Rolex says human hands touch every watch. And I believe that, um, but I think they, you know, put a pinky on it as it's flying by, <laughs> you know, on a conveyor belt. Um, and and I, I exaggerate because there, there, there is some handwork in, in uh, uh, installing and testing the movements and so forth. But uh, Rolex is highly uh, mechanized. It, it's, uh, and by the way, it's amazing. It's amazing what they can accomplish with machinery. So bless them for what they have done. Uh, it's truly amazing. However, um, Patek Philippe is still assembled by hand. Uh, literally, I think most steps, not too much mechanization and therefore they make 10 times fewer watches. But um, what's happening is Rolex is, wants to become as exclusive as a Patek Philippe. Patek's 
whole advertising slogan, guys. It used to be, you don't buy a Patek, you merely care for it for the next generation because it's like a bespoke boutique kind of pass it on to the kids sort of an item. But uh, let me tell you what, Rolex is, um, I don't know, they were, they were miles behind Patek Philippe in that area. And um, I think Patek is here in footsteps right now. And I don't think it will be long before Rolex is tougher to get. I was actually in an authorized dealer um, like, about two months ago, and they had almost nothing in the way of Rolex for me to try on, but they had six Patek Philippe's laying out, and they were nice ones. Um, uh, they had a white gold Calatrava all the way up through an annual calendar. And they, and honestly, uh, although I was wearing a gold Submariner at the time, which meant that they looked at me and said, oh, this guy is, you know, this is our kind of guy. I was dressed down, okay? I was in like dog trainer clothes. And that's my profession, dog trainer. So I, I was uh, hardly dressed up. And um, they were all but begging me to try on these Pateks. And honestly, I didn't want to do it. Because um, A, I knew I wasn't in the market um, for the watch. And unlike Don Haynes, my buddy who tries on everything just to mess with these salespeople, I, I didn't want my picture in the lunchroom of, of that dealer saying, never let this guy in the store again. You know, and, and also I know if I tried on the watches, they would have to spend, you know, a few minutes with each watch cleaning them because they're meticulous about such things. And I honestly didn't want to put them to the trouble. But let me move on to my exciting sort of conclusion here. And that is the Rolex has become so difficult to get. I mean, it's almost impossible at the AD, even at my AD. Uh, who is is terrific, uh, James and Sons. They've got several locations in and around the Chicago area. Uh, if you are in the market for an AD somewhere in the area, I absolutely recommend that you talk to my friend Brian over at James and Sons at the uh, Orland Park location. He is the manager there. The thing is, guys, um, you know, a lot of the ADs are actually, well, I think this is a worldwide problem. They are under... Um, they are under inventoried and they are over molested by customers. It's like I talked to my friend Blue Shirt Buddha who said that, um, that his AD gets upward of 50 to 100 calls per day asking specifically about the same, you know, six Rolex steel sports watches. So imagine you're on the end of that, like your job is to basically tell people no and you don't make any commission out of that, you don't make a living out of that, it would have to get annoying. So I'm swinging back to James and Sons, the reason I mention them from time to time in my videos is they're nice, they're polite, they understand, they know about collectors. So they may not have what you want right now, but, um, but, but they'll give you a realistic idea of what's, of what's possible. But I also recommend that you make friends with your AD, um, and I don't mean in an artificial way, like you can't buy an AD off. Remember, there's hundreds of people per day, if not per you know, week, trying to sweet talk them. So I'm talking about being genuine, right? Okay, so because Rolex has gotten so difficult to buy, a rising tide lifts all boats, as my friend Clyde Anderson, the rancher, likes to say. And this is, um, this is true, which is why the price of even watches uh, such as the brands I've mentioned, let alone Omega, have risen and gotten maybe slightly more difficult to acquire. Also, people are flocking hardcore to Tudor right now because they can't get Rolex, which, you know, if you're a conspiracy theorist, that could be the entire plan. And that brings me to sort of like my final point here, which is fun watches, fun watches. Now, a fun watch for me is um, anything, and then by the way, your definition of a fun watch, well, Archie calls them, you know what he calls them. He doesn't call them fun watches. He has, he has no respect. But, you know, that's okay. To each his own. Um, the, the reality is, is that most of us get sucked into that sort of a thinking. But let me make the case for fun watches. First, where does it stop being a fun watch and where does it start being like something serious? That is going to depend entirely on your economic situation and your own personal views of such things. I could tell you for me, I'm really comfortable buying fun watches up to, oh, $300. Let's even move, let's tuck that up a little bit and say 400. If it's a $400 watch, right, or less, um, am I gonna look to see, will I like it $400 worth? 
or three or one? Absolutely, of course. You know, that, that is important to me. I don't want to get a $400 watch and think, I hate it, I'm sorry. You know, I could have done something much more important with that $400. Um, but in my personal category, to me, that's like a fun watch. Now, as we speak, I am wearing a, um, a $1,500 watch that I would actually, I got to call it a, a very well put together but fun watch. It is a, um, a Seiko Baluna. It is a Tuna. It's uh, quartz. I love it. Um, it costs about $1,500. It's brand new. I got it from Nomon Watches, uh, which shipped to me from, where, where are they guys? Hong Kong? Anyway, that was a great, that was a great, uh, that was a great transaction. You know, and it's a terrific watch. It's not likely to lose a lot of money if I decide I want to flip it. It's certainly not going to gain a lot either. I'm, I'm sure it would lose a little, but it's not going to tank. Um, and that's why I was kind of comfortable with a fun watch stepping outside the $400 range. But guys, I own a bunch of Seikos in, in different iterations, uh, turtles of various dials. Um, uh, I have a Grand Seiko, which is not a fun watch, because I don't know, what is that, like a $5,000 watch, the, the Seiko uh, Spring Drive Diver in steel. So that's not a fun watch, that's kind of a serious watch. But um, I own a couple of Orients, I own a Hamilton khaki scuba diver, and some of these will have been flitting past your eyes as we discuss here. And and I own, I, I, guys, honestly, I lost count of the G-Shocks. They kind of got away from me. <laughs> so one of these days, I got I to gotta blow out some, some G-Shocks that I'm not using uh, with any regularity. But the reality is, is that in my world, there's room for a few thousand dollars worth of fun watches. These keep me in the game. I am, um, if, I'm, if I'm, oh, and I bought a deep blue with T100 tritium tubes that I'm really enjoying right now. And um, the reality is, is that if I'm going to go, right now there's not a lot of, you know, vacation for, for many of us, and, and there's not been for me either, right? But if I was going to a city w which is renowned for ripping off Rolex, um, I probably wouldn't want to wear one, okay? So I would be more likely to wear, I don't know, my Omega, one of my Seikos, something a little bit more fun. Uh, I don't want to wear anything that bores me. I'm a dive watch guy. I like colorful dials and clicky bezels. And if it has the day of the week on there, so much the better. It makes me happy, this kind of stuff. But the reality is, is that I can't have all my fun with Rolex. Now, ironically, I'm the guy who invented the phrase, feel the steel. You wear your Rolex. But the times, the question is, are the times changing? Has it gotten more dangerous to wear a Rolex where you live? Um, now, I know a lot of Americans are First Amendment people, and they say, you know, they're not afraid, and I, I get that, but, you know, guys, you could get clubbed over the back of the head before you even know it for Rolex. There's, it, it, it can be dangerous, so tell me if it's dangerous where you are. Um, doesn't mean I don't wear a Rolex uh, now and again, because certainly I do. I own them. I want to enjoy them. I do want to feel that steel or the gold in the case of the Submariner. But the reality is, these days, most of the time, I am working and wandering around in a fun watch, and that's what I call them. What do you call it? Let's talk about this in the comments. Thank you so much for joining me and spending this time with me. If you didn't already do it, hit the like for me and subscribe. This is Goldberg. Peace out. Paint the sky.